Well, good morning, AP Bio students. This is Shelton here. Um, I'm putting together just a really quick Chapter 20 uh, screencastify for you. Um, I thought I posted just some other videos, but most of you guys are asking for a screencastify by me also, um, just to make sure you have just that backup information of the main parts of Chapter 20, which is on phylogeny. Now, the first and most important thing that you recognize is what this word phylogeny actually means. Phylogeny really is the evolutionary relationships of all living things on this planet. Um, so with that, some of the concepts that we need to make sure that we understand is understand that in determining these evolutionary relationships, um, once we use all of our mechanisms and all of our evidences of evolution, this is where we create um, phylogenetic trees. Phylogenetic trees are hypotheses of the relatedness of all life on this planet. Um, or in our relationships from a descent from a common ancestor, but also then the classification of these organisms too. And if we're talking specifically about classification, we are talking about taxonomy. So those are some concepts that we need to make sure that we are addressing. So let me switch over here to the presentation and we'll go over some of these key terms from your notes. Keep in mind that in the test prep review book, this is actually topic seven. So the unit that we are currently on, you're gonna be using the test prep review book, topic six and topic seven. Um, go together. Um, and then the study guide from the old textbook was chapter 25. That's going to give you um, some good practice problems um, in order to work out phylogenetic trees and cladograms and also your classification system. So let's switch over here to the PowerPoint and go ahead and get this going so we can see. Ooh, we can see our picture of what most people like to think is a picture of a snake, but it's not. Uh, this is a legless lizard. Um, so with this particular legless lizard, this is really just an example of how sometimes an analogous structure can kind of lead us on the wrong path of evolutionary relationships. So with this, I mean, yes, this is related to a snake, but actually they don't share a recent common ancestor. Um, through systematics, through looking at homologous structures, looking at anatomical features that are the same, looking at molecular homologies, which are then your DNA protein similarities. What we actually find is that this eastern glass lizard that's legless actually shared a more recent common ancestor with something like the monitor lizard. This is a phylogenetic tree, and this phylogenetic tree is actually showing us the evolutionary relationships of organisms. Your task will be to be able to read and interpret these phylogenetic trees. Now, this is showing that there was an ancestral lizard at one point in time, but with that, if we look at a snake, here's a snake with no limbs, but limbs actually evolved, actually in geckos, limbs evolved in iguanas. So here's my ancestral lizard that had limbs, but this evolution of no limbs became an advantage for snakes in their habitat. But then also from this, from this common ancestor, while well, having no limbs became an advantage for this eastern glass lizard in their habitat. So that's when we actually see some modifications is does the habitat actually support that particular adaptation to be an advantage for survival and reproduction. Now again, we have to make sure that we are careful and not just assuming these analogies show relatedness. We always have to use all pieces of evidence in order to determine our best hypothesis for relatedness. And the best hypothesis that we actually have is that the monitor lizard and the eastern glass lizard shared a more recent common ancestor. This branch point here in this phylogenetic tree would indicate the common ancestor that was shared by snakes and this eastern glass lizard. So you can actually see a lot of, of, of other descent, a lot of branching that actually happened since then. Now, when we actually determine evolutionary relationships, that's what our taxonomic scheme is, is also designed to demonstrate for us. So when we classify an organism, that's what taxonomy is, we actually use the classification scheme that was established in the 1700s by Carl Linnaeus. Um, and with that, we actually start with, actually how I learned it back when I was in high school, is we started with kingdom. Kingdom was actually how we first classified an organism. Um, but now, because we know more, because of molecular data, we actually now have a domain system. So domains are actually the most inclusive categories that we start out with. 
And so our domains actually get classified based on just cell type. And so with domain eukarya, all eukaryote cells are in the domain eukarya. But actually, again, through molecular evidence, we realize that prokaryotes, prokaryotes actually are quite different from each other. So we actually have a domain bacteria and a domain archaea. And we find that they branched and actually separated way early on. And actually domain eukarya and domain archaea are actually share a more recent common ancestor than do the domain bacteria and archaea. Now, what used to happen, so back in the 80s when I was in high school, um, we actually, in our five kingdom system, we had the kingdom Monera. The kingdom Monera is where the dumping ground where all prokaryotes were. Um, as we gain more evidence and we learn more, we alter our hypotheses that we have. But the classification scheme that you guys need to make sure that you are aware of is that we first classify an organism based on domain, and then we break it down smaller to the kingdom, then to phylum, to class, to order, to family, to genus, and then the most exclusive, the most specific is then the species name. So like here, what I have is I have a panther. So in the official name, scientific name for this panther is Panthera partis. So that is binomial nomenclature. So binomial no nomenclature always uses the genus name and the species name. Now in this classification scheme, the smaller the taxa that is shared shows relatedness. So a question that I asked you guys in class is with this black bear, is this black bear more closely related to a raccoon or to a wolf? And actually from this, since the raccoon and the bear share family, but the wolf and the bear share order, we would actually indicate that the raccoon and the bear actually share a more recent common ancestor. If that's a raccoon, I think it is. So you do have to memorize domain, kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, species from the most inclusive taxa to the most exclusive taxa. Now, mnemonics actually help in understanding and remembering these for some people. Personally, I still remember the mnemonic that I learned um, back in 1981 is I learned that King Philip could only find green shoes. Well, now, of course, that's been modified. So now I have, I still use dumb King Philip could only find green shoes. Another mnemonic that students have used in the past is dumb kids playing chess on freeways get squished. Whatever works. So, or you just remember domain, kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, species in that hierarchy. So that is our taxonomy. Now, in phylogenetic trees, um, make sure that when you are reading a phylogenetic tree, a couple of terms that you guys need to make sure that you are recognizing and how these structures are set up is, and so here's one that's actually showing you a phylogenetic tree and then how they are grouped in their different taxonomic levels. So here's your Panthera partis. And so it's actually showing you that here's a common ancestor. The most common ancestor, recent common ancestor for Panthera partis was actually here at this order level is where this was. Um, but we can actually see here through these sister taxae that the American badger and the European otter actually shared a recent ancestor here. This is what these branch points are showing. These would be referred to as sister taxa because they share a recent common ancestor. The coyote and the gray wolf are also now sister taxa to each other because they share a common ancestor. In this particular phylogenetic tree, Another term that you should be aware of is what the outgroup is. And in this particular tree, the outgroup is actually Panthera partis because its recent ancestor was the furthest, the oldest from everything else in this particular group. But again, phylogenetic trees are hypotheses. And as hypotheses, as we gain more evidence and we learn more, um, these are subject to change. That doesn't mean that we were wrong. This was just our best explanation of relatedness based on the information that was available to us at that point. Go figure, scientists, as we gather more information, we actually alter our ideas. So here's just a, a quick little summary of how to make sure you're reading those. Again, all of these branch points are representation of a common ancestor. Now that common ancestor, we sometimes know, and most of the time we don't know what that common ancestor was. We just know the organisms that we're finding either in the fossil record or the extant organisms, the extant being those that are still alive. 
So those are some words that also get used in context, not necessarily defined, extant and extinct. If it's extinct, it means it's, it's no longer on this planet. And if it's extant, it means it's still alive. So those are kind of opposite terms if you ever see those in the reading. Now, how we determine these is just from chapter 19, our different evidences of evolution that we have. Homologies is the term that we need to make sure that we are learning. Either homologous structures um, from either bone structures through digestive systems, through nervous systems, um, to molecular homologies. When we're talking about molecular homologies, we're talking about analysis of DNA, analysis of protein structures, et cetera. Be careful, again, of analogies. So when it's an analogous structure, a lot of times we look and think, oh, they must be closely related um, because they look the same or they have similar features. Again, like the legless lizard versus the snake, well, the fact that they didn't have limbs was actually an example of convergent evolution. Those were analogous structures, which is why we need to use all pieces of evidence that we have available to us. Here's just showing you um, a molecular homology of a cytochrome C protein. Cytochrome C protein is one protein that's an electron transport chain of the mitochondria. So with this, um, if we look at the amino acid differences from humans to these other organisms, here's also what we understand about when the common ancestor occurred. So when divergence occurs, so divergence from a common ancestor, this is how we look at phylogenetic trees and we look at evolutionary relationships is the sooner the ancestor, so the more recent the common ancestor, the fewer changes have accumulated in the DNA or therefore in the proteins. So here in a chimpanzee, there's zero differences in this particular protein. A rhesus monkey, there's one. A rabbit, there's nine. So what this would indicate is that humans and rabbits shared a common ancestor long time ago as compared to a chimpanzee and a human. So this is how we would use this accumulation of change, which is another concept of molecular clocks, just knowing that mutations happen, mutations occur, changes in DNA, therefore changes in proteins will accumulate over time. And the longer that the divergence occurred, then the more accumulation of change that has also occurred. Here's just showing just from DNA analysis, we know the types of mutations that exist. So we look at deletions, insertions, we look at base pair substitutions in order to, again, compare molecularly the DNA. When we do study phylogenetic groups, here's what I need you guys to make sure that you are recognizing is what a clade is. A clade is the common ancestor and all of the species that diverged from it. This is actually the way that we should be looking at phylogenetic trees, is in a monophyletic group the common ancestor, and then every other species after. You don't need to memorize paraphyletic and polyphyletic. I just need you guys to see this as being a different way. Like if I grouped these three organisms together, well, really I should have also included G in my phylogenetic tree in order to show relatedness. So, and here I should have not included D perhaps, or if I'm gonna do this, I needed to include all of the organisms if I was going to be representing a clade. So again, here's what we're looking at. Um, so just again, looking at another phylogenetic tree, here's my common ancestor of my even-toed ungulates. And actually we can see through evolution um, and through systematics, we've actually determined that cetaceans, these dolphins, actually shared a more recent common ancestor with even other even-toed ungulates and hippopotami versus then even seals or bears or carnivores. So this is again what our phylogenetic trees help us to determine. Now the skill that you are going to have to be able to do, and College Board will expect you guys to do this, is be able to create a cladogram. Now cladograms end up showing evolutionary relationships, but they are based on derived characteristics. Because what we understand about divergence is when a new unique feature actually evolves, it usually is extremely beneficial. And so all organisms that diverge from that, that actually all share that common ancestry, are also going to maintain some evidence of having that particular derived characteristic. So in this, we're not worried about time. And again, branches of phylogenetic trees are not showing 
time, they're just showing order of events is what they're actually showing. This is showing order of events for these different organisms. Now here, my lancelet is the outgroup. So with this, there is an ancestral characteristic that put this particular organism we chose this is an outgroup. And then from that, now this derived characteristic of having a vertebral column um, would end up then being what now created this divergence. Every other organism that actually evolved from the origination of the vertebral column still has that vertebral column. But then new unique features appear in the fossil record like jaws, but a lamprey that still exists has a vertebral column, but no jaws. Here are four walking legs. Well, we have vertebral column and jaws, but not four walking legs. So again, I have these different branches that end up occurring. So what I need you guys to be aware of on a cladogram is cladograms are des de designed. One, we are studying an in-group. My in-group here is the leopard that actually has all of these derived characteristics. I have an out-group. My out-group is the one that is least related, but it has to have some ancestral characteristic that put this on the cladogram. And then from there, I have all of these branches and these branches are determined based on these derived characteristics. So this would be an example of a data table that College Board might give you of these different characters. And from that, you create then this cladogram. Um, in the BLAST lab, the BLAST lab is giving you multiple examples of how to draw cladograms. And then also in Schoology, I posted for you um, just a cladogram practice document for you as well to get practice in creating cladograms based on the data that's given. There are some phylogenetic trees that do actually represent time. So be aware, the axes are going to be labeled if they do represent time. So sometimes in this case, I mean, you, you might be asked a question of how many million years ago did a chicken and a zebra fish share a common ancestor? So you should be able to go, oh, chicken, zebra fish, here's where they shared a recent common ancestor. So that was 400 million years ago. So um, again, sometimes phylogenetic trees, the lengths of the branches are going to be show, showing you time. Most of the time though, when it's something like this, this is not representative of time, it's just representative of order of events. Now, we talked about molecular clocks. So, and just kind of understanding this concept that mutation happens. And so in certain genes, um, certain genes will accumulate mutations at a known rate of time. And so based on the number of mutations that have accumulated in DNA, we can actually determine the point of divergence is what can happen. Now, factors that influence those clocks is, is it a highly conserved gene? If it's a highly conserved gene, then number of mutations are going to be smaller. If it's not a highly conserved gene, then the mutation rate is going to be faster. The reproduction rate of the cells. Um, of the organism is also going to change that rate of the molecular clock. But these are actually things that we use in order to determine when did the point of divergence occur. In the last section in 20.5, it's making sure that you are recognizing our three domain system. Now, this is not new information for you. We have covered the domains um, before. But recognizing that our domain eukarya, this is actually how we classify all eukaryotes. So if I find a eukaryote cell with a nucleus, it is in the domain eukarya. If it's a prokaryote, so no nucleus, single-celled organisms, it's going to be in the domain archaea and the domain bacteria. Now from this, what College Board will also ask you is what is, what is evidence that all of these organisms, all life derived from a single common ancestor. And the evidence of unity, and that's what we look for, is what's our evidence of unity? What are the things that all living things on this planet do? Now, things that we have learned in this class is we have learned that all living things are made of cells with lipid bilayer. We know that cells replicate their genetic material. So DNA replication is a process that's evidence of evolution. We know that DNA is, has to be transcribed and translated. The universal genetic code is a huge piece of, of evidence of evolution from a common ancestor of life. And then when we look at cellular respiration, we know that every living thing on this planet performs glycolysis. So again, those would be pieces of evidence that all organisms have derived from a common ancestor of life. 
Now, what this phylogenetic tree is also showing us, though, is that domain eukarya and domain archaea. So remember, archaea are my prokaryotes that live in extreme conditions. And that's the only detail you need to know right now. My domain bacteria, these are my prokaryotes that are common that are on us and in us in very, very high numbers. So we actually see that the shared common ancestor between eukarya and archaea actually was more recent than the common ancestor shared between even archaea and bacteria. So with this, how do we know that? Molecular evidence. So molecular homologies is what has changed this, which is why we now have a three domain system instead of a five kingdom system. The five kingdom system we used to have, again, we had the kingdom Monera when I was in high school, that no longer exists. We now have within the domain eukarya four kingdoms, plants, animals, fungus, and protists. And then we have our prokaryotes have been divided into the domain archaea and the domain bacteria. Now, lastly, just something cool. We remember endosymbiotic theory. And with endosymbiotic theory, um, this is giving us an evidence of this horizontal gene transfer. So evolution is not always just these straight line divergences. Sometimes there's exchanges of genetic material, especially in that single cell state. There was a lot of exchanges of material, and especially in prokaryotes. Prokaryotes um, can exchange plasmids in order to um, transfer information and transfer genetic material. But we remember endosymbiotic theory where cells were engulfed by other cells, and we still have evidence of this horizontal gene transfer in our chloroplasts and mitochondria in the fact that they are double membrane structures, and they still have circular DNA that we find in all prokaryotes. And we also find proteobacteria and cyanobacteria that actually can act independently like their own chloroplasts or like their own mitochondria. Um, they just don't have, they just actually have their cell membranes do electron transport um, in order to behave that way. Uh, but again, that's, this is just trying to show you this horizontal gene transfer. So there is chapter 20. Um, just a summary for you guys. Um, again, we are trying to make sure that we are understanding just how to read phylogenetic trees. We're understanding our taxonomic system. So what are our levels of taxonomy from domain down to species? And then making sure that we can draw cladograms and we can um, understand how these phylogenetic trees and these cladograms are actually created and we can actually then read them. So with that, I'll see you guys in class. Um, and we will talk more about um, natural selection and evolution in our upcoming chapters.